السلام عليكم مسيكم بالخير uh, Good evening uh, from here Amman Jordan from the Farah Medical Campus My name is Abraham Shreya I am a neurosurgeon and we are transmitting live to our international audience This is a very famous uh, painting called the Raft of Medusa by this uh, French gentleman back in 1818. Uh, Medusa was a flagship of the uh, French uh, Navy, which sank uh, opposite Ma Mauritania. And these are the only people who survived, 15 people. There were more than that, but they ate the dead people so that they can survive. Uh, our uh, presentation today is pediatric tumor in the lateral ventricle and pediatric case. So we are talking about the lateral ventricle, and this is the lateral ventricle within the skull. Any neurosurgical resident or you know, practicing neurosurgeon must visualize what exactly is the ventricular system in relation to the cell, to the various parts of the brain. So the lateral ventricle is made of the anterior hole of the body, of the trigone, occipital hole, and the temporal hole. Again, relationship of the lateral ventricle with the third ventricle at the foramen of Monroe, and the ectoductive cellulose to the fourth ventricle. Here, you would see two structures, the thalamus, uh, outside and inside is the head of the caudate nucleus. Here is again the same thing, ventricle, septum lucidum, and here is the mammillary body, and we have a tract between mammillary and thalamus, and then we have the fornix, the columns of the fornix, the body of the fornix, and the fimbria of the fornix. Uh, ventricles are supplied by uh, blood, of course, like any other structure in the brain, and we have the anterior choroidal artery coming directly from the carotid, and the two posterior uh, choroidal artery coming from the, from the posterior cerebral. One of them is medial to the other, so they are called medial posterior choroidal, lateral posterior choroidal, and of course the anterior choroidal. Anterior choroidal, against all beliefs, supply only the temporal hole, while the posterior choroidal supply most of the ventricular system. Again, if you ask any neurosurgical resident about this anatomy, they have no idea, no clue. If we look at the ventricles from the top, you will see the head of the caudate lying on top of the thalamus, like, like this, the external capsule. So, head of caudate thalamus. So, thalamus is here in the choroidal fissure. Again, we have to imagine where the choroidal arteries are. This is the carotid artery, so the anterior choroidal comes this way to supply the temporal horn. While from the posterior cerebral, we have the two medial and lateral choroidal arteries supplying the rest of the ventricular system. Another look here at the ventricles from above. The lateral ventricle here, the lateral ventricle there, right side, the anterior horn, the body. We come to the trigone, occipital horn, and then the temporal horn. And the choroid plexus, of course, is C shaped in the choroid tissues. Again, the same picture with more cutting to see or to show the temporal horn. And I challenge if there is any neurosurgical resident who would know. What are the relations of the temporal horn to the brain? It's a mystery. They don't know. They just want to know about how to put screws in the cervical area. Again, here we have to, to remember one important anatomical feature, which is the optic radiation. Optic nerve, and then the chiasm, and then the tract coming to the lateral genicular body, giving the temporal loop and then the optic radiation going to the <coughs> 17, 18, 19 in the occipital loop. And this optic radiation is very much in relation to the ventricular system. 
it lies in the lateral wall and the inferior wall of the occipital horn, like this, lateral wall and the inferior wall. So optic radiation is very important to remember when you are dealing with the ventricular system, the lateral ventricle. So this is a very beautiful bit about the optic radiations from Italy, how the optic radiation would look in various uh, objects and uh, various patients. Of course, this is a tractography. Again, optic nerve, tract, casmere, tract, coming to the lateral genital body, giving the temporal loop, and then going around to the occipital area. So here you are, temporal, minus loop, temporal, same thing here. Why am I mentioning this? Because it has very much relation to the surgery, you will, you will see. So this optic radiation will be displaced by various tumors. This is intrinsic brain tumor. Because it is intrinsic, it would push the optic radiation, which is here, would be pushed medially, like this. So it would push it medially. While if you are inside the ventricle, the optic radiation would be pushed laterally. Again, you have to remember the relationship of the various tracts through tractography, whether it is motor or sensory or whatever association factors. But here you can see with the tractography, the optic radiation. If you look at the ventricles from front, coronal view, hemisphere, hemisphere, interhemispheric fissure, corpus callosum, anterior horn of the lateral ventricles, the third ventricle. And of course, the ventricle is very much related to the internal capsule. And one of the questions I asked the neurosurgical residents in the exam is how far is the motor cortex or the internal capsule from the foramen of Monroe? And the answer is less than one millimeter. Again, until you have to remember the choroidal artery, how it's supplying the temporal horn, and the, both the medial and lateral occipital arteries supplying the rest of the ventricles. Our topic for today is intraventricular meningiomas. Are these rare? Yes, they are. One to two percent of all meningiomas. What is the commonest meningioma in the brain? It is the parasagittal, it is the cortical. Uh, so this composes one or two percent of all meningiomas inside the ventricle. In the theatric group, it's more. And how would you get meningioma inside the ventricle? Because meningioma does not arise from the dura arises from the arachnoid. And the arachnoid is part of the choroid plexus. Choroid plexus is inside the ventricle, so you'll get intraventricular meningiomas. They attain big size, 2.5 usually at the time of admission or seeing the patient, but they can be as large as eight centimeters. <clears throat> so meningiomas are related to the choroid plexus, the arachnoid of the choroid plexus. And which is the commonest area for these meningiomas? Lateral ventricles, more than third ventricle, more than the fourth. So most of the tumors of meningiomas, they occur in the lateral ventricle. Which side? Left side one. Why? Nobody knows. Which part of the ventricle? Lateral ventricle, trigone, is the most common part. From the trigone, it goes to the posterior horn or the body or the temporal horn, and of course, the temporal. Anterior horn, Zero. Why? No. And zero because there's no correct plexus. <laughs> and this study of 72 cases, not of meningiomas, but of ventricular tumors, 72 cases of ventricular tumors, it was common in the trigon. Again, in a study, 46 patients from Turkey, Meningiomas constitute only six out of the 46. So it is not common, it is rare. In children, 54 cases of lateral ventricular tumors. Of course, you will have all the tumors, but to a lesser extent, the meningiomas. So this is the list of these tumors. Subvendimal giant astrocytoma is the commonest, meningioma is less. So whether in adults or in children, it is not a common tumor but it is a very challenging tumor. Presentation, 
usually increased intracranial pressure. The commonest is headache. And I have a word about headache. Uh, in the Arab world, in this part of the world, in the Arab states, Muslim states, in Asia, we don't take care of the headaches. We deal with it as if it is nothing. The commonest thing that I hear from my patients, yes, I used to have headaches, which are normal headaches, relieved by simple analgesia. Remember, there is nothing called normal headache. If you have headache, there is a cause for it. Visual symptoms, because we are related to the visual tracts which we mentioned, related to the tenor capsule, and get stabbers because of the hydrocephalus, urinary because of the hydrocephalus, seizures. Is it common to have seizures when you have intraventricular? It is very common, actually, up to 30%. And if you are having a tumor in the ventricle, in the dominant hemisphere, then you'll have temporal or parietal uh, manifestations. Uh, this is from Al Mifti book, uh, many journals. Uh, he looked at the uh, authors who reported these cases and he looked at how much the headache was there. It's very high percentage. So, epilepsy, preoperative or postoperative? Usually, postoperative epilepsy is more. And it could be generalized, it could be focal, it could be complex question. How much the headache was there? It's very high percentage. Is this the only manifestations of uh, intracranial, intraventricular meningiomas? No. This paper from Germany, 2007, about fatal hemorrhage from this meningioma. So meningioma was inside the head of a patient who did not recognize that he has a tumor, it bled, and caused him to die. Meningiomas, one of the commonest tumors to have hemorrhage. Another paper from China, 2011, again about meningioma that has bled. And they looked into literature and found these authors reporting cases of meningioma that bled inside the ventricle. What about imaging? This is a very interesting case of mine, I think it summarizes all. You can get calcification in 50 to 90% of these tumors. It happens that this patient is from Tophile and he had this huge calcified meningioma, maybe because it's from there. When you do angiogram, you are looking for the anterior choroidal and you are looking for the two posterior choroidals. So the blood supply of these lesions usually comes from anterior or from anterior inferior. When you are attacking them, you will not come through the blood supply itself. That's why it is a challenge. This is another paper about the feeding arteries, the internal tumor anterior or anterior inferior. This is the tumor, and this is the anterior choroidal artery. If you put this picture for a sixth year neurosurgical resident in Jordan, he would not know anything about it. He would not do it don't tell Because we don't teach them about in geography. This is not for the neurosurgeons. Machine level. Machine level is not So this is the anterior choroidal. Here, this is the posterior choroidal. You have to know exactly where they are because you want to do surgery for them, you have to see them. The other day we, we reported the, the orbit. People say, oh, orbit is not for neurosurgeon. It is for neurosurgeon. You will deal with the orbit every time you open the skull of the patient. What about the treatment? No doubt, treatment of choice is surgery. But look at this, mortality before the microscope was very high because it is a challenging kind of a surgery. It was reported first as a finding in 1854 by Shaw. Cushing did the first surgery for intraventricular tumor in 1916, and this is a monograph of Walter Dandy in 33. All these patients died. If you want to do surgery, you have to avoid damage to the sensory tracts, to the optic radiation, and to the white matter interconnectivity. Well, what is this? Let's see. How would you approach the ventricle anterior? horn, body, trigone, occipital horn, temporal horn. So you reach each in a different way. Anterior frontal, transcortical, according to the sides, 
here with open. This is a very important piece of anatomy to remember. This is the ventricle. If you have a tumor here in the channel one, how would you approach it? Again, there's a beautiful paper about the how to approach each part of the ventricles. Again, neurosurgical resident or neurosurgical practicing, you have to imagine the ventricles, where they are and how to reach them, and what are the relationships of these uh, areas. Just in time. Again, people don't know this anatomy, especially when you open the skull, because you open the skull for a small area. So if you open it here, you'll find a piece of the brain. But which part of the brain? Who of the neurosurgical residents in Jordan or the Arab world or in Asia or developing country know the, quote, the surface anatomy of these lesions? They don't need to, because what he's interested in is to put a sucker to suck the brain and treat the brain as if it is shit. Sorry for the word. So you have to remember the sylvian fissure, the ascending limb of the sylvian fissure, this anatomy, the supraangular and the, the supramarginal and the angular gyri. Because when you open, you will open in this area. And vein of la bay is in your face. Damage this, patient will be hemiplegic, if not dead. Frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, tumoral lobe, sylvian fissure, ascending limb. This is the motor strip, this is sensory strip, and the sulcus in between, supramarginal angular and angular gyrus. Where we open is here. This is shortest distance to the trigon, avoiding important areas. So you go through the brain, through the cortex, to reach to the trigon either through the parietal lobe or the temporal lobe or frontal lobe according to where the tumor is, or you go in between the hemispheres, the transcallosal. And when you do the parietal, your corticotomy should be away from the midline, it should avoid the central uh, sulcus. So here you are, transcortical, transparietal, reaching to the trigon of the lateral ventricle. So this is tumor meningioma and you will go through this one. It's called transcortical. And this is the optic radiation which we spoke about. So you have either to be a little bit low or a little bit above to avoid injury to the optic radiation. Parietal transcortical. This is the superior parietal, middle parietal. So you will go this way or you go through the temporal area through this way. Or you go in between the hemispheres this way. The same thing, parietal, between the parietal P1 and P2 parietal. Here is transtemporal, T. T means middle gyrus, three is the inferior gyrus. So you go through middle gyrus to the trigon. Or as I said, you go interhemispheric. Some people are extravagant about their approach. They would go this way, trans to the other side. I think this is too sophisticated and too complicated to accomplish. Michael McDermott, which is a very famous uh, meningioma surgeon, he's a meningioma man in San Francisco. And he published this paper about interventricular meningiomas of different sizes. And he again, I stress the important point of the optic radiation. Optic radiation is lateral and inferior to the trigone and to the occipital hole. So you have to be careful about it. This is the interhemispheric. This is the right side. Here is the midline. You go in between the hemispheres. You go and do, cort uh, do cortical incision, the corpus callosum, and enter into the ventricular system. <coughs> Like this. So you will go, you have gone inter hemispheric. Engelbert Knoss from Vienna, Alexander Papalanti from Switzerland, Germany, they published this and they wrote this chapter of uh, 
and in Jama, the letter identical in Al-Mifti and in Jama book, and they again set the approaches to reach to the triangle. Nasr, of course, is the man who discovered the relationship of the pituitary to the cavernous science, the lines of so lines of Engelbert and Nasr. Again, this paper, as I said, it is the contralateral transfer sign. I don't believe in this extravaganza because it is not needed from China. You can use the endoscope, the, uh, the endoscope, yes. Uh, this paper from uh, China, again, they went into ventricular cysts. They are good for cysts, no, no doubt about that. Mark Swedan from Lebanon, who lives in the States, he's a famous man in endoscopy. Again, he used the endoscope extensively to remove such regions like colloid cysts. Here's the formula of Monroe, this is the colloid plexus, this is the cyst. So endoscopy is one of the armamentarium that we use in uh, our surgery. And this paper by Charla Banki is a female lady with Axel Berniski from Mainz in Germany. And they published this paper about surgery with the use of the endoscope. What about radio surgery? Imagine people using radio surgery for intraventricular tumor. Let's see what these people, the giants of meningioma, what would they say? Not the brains were the giants of meningiomas. I call myself a meningioma man, but these are giants. William McDermott, Sam and Mifti, Engelbert Knoss, Alexander Bertalanfi, radio surgery is only for those who are not candidates for surgery. Period. No matter what they say, you don't use radio surgery up front. No matter what paper they produce, no matter what jargon they would use. Paper from Japan. Look at this. The title is very interesting. Presumed intraventricular meningioma because they don't know what it is. Without a biopsy, without anything. Oh, this is the tumor. Let's give some embolization. It will get shrink and then we'll hit it with the gamma ray. Observed kind of thinking. I don't know how these people think. What about this remaining in the head of the patient five to seven years and then turn malignant? <clears throat> gamma ray surgery for intraventricular meningioma. Again. It is laughable for me. Oh, this is the tumor. Uh, this is the radiation. Oh, here it is. Three years after. So what? What have you done? This is the mockery of all. Gamma knife for superficially located meningiomas. Why would you get a gamma knife for superficially located? Gamma knife is a good tool. It was made to treat small lesions that are very deep that cannot be reached by surgery. Why in the hell would you go for this kind of tools? Yesterday, I came across this and I had to share it with you. Gamma knife being given to five tumors, five tumors at the same session. Bilateral, Big tumors at that. <laughs> bilateral, and each tumor was treated as single lesion for the same amount of money. So five lesions, Contraindicated. Absolutely contraindicated. Absolutely it defeats the ob object of radio surgery. <laughs> but look at this. Why, why would you treat? Why would you treat this? Why? Tell me, why would you treat? Why would you treat this? Ah, uh, yes. Look, personal series of mine. I published this paper a long time ago, 2009, with my residents, Amir and Muhammad and Omar. Uh, they are very good people and they have gone very far in their discipline. Uh, we published this in the Pan Arab Journal of Neurosurgery. And this was about this uh, Jordanian family who was suffered in the Magian Cell Society. I think we have presented this here. This is the father, this is the mother, father is okay, mother is a carrier, and these are the three children, male children. The elder boy, the middle boy, the young boy, all with these Sega kind of tumors. So my series 85 to 2018 of intraventricular meningiomas, I'm not talking about intraventricular tumors, 
talk about intraventricular meningiomas. If I want to mention the intraventricular tumors, I have about 162 third ventricular tumor, and I have more than 350 of lateral ventricular tumors. But if we take just the meningiomas, I have 20 cases. It says the frequency is to get one case per year if you have a high volume, which means that in 30, 33 years, I should be getting maximally, maximally 20 or 15. And these are common more in females than males. And again, left side was more. Uh, some of these cases, which I came across, different kinds of meningiomas. These are actual cases of mine. So let's come to the case for tonight. I think I'll do well regarding time. Uh, this is a boy, 33 year old. He came to the hospital in the middle of the night, unconscious, Glasgow coma scale eight, clicks dilated pupil. No movement at all on the left side. What would you do? Let's see his images quickly. Look at this. This is a dying <coughs> person. This boy, his leg is in his grave. He is going to die, except for God's will and wish. Look at the shifts. Look at the pressure on the midbrain. Look at this, very vague tumor, it's very ugly. It's, it's not well defined, it is hazy, but look at the shift it's causing and the hydrocephalus it is causing. What's the treatment? Shunt, no. If you shunt him, he will die on the spot. If you even put external drain, you have to put it very carefully. So the only thing that you can do is surgery. No shunts, no external drain, just go for it. Why? Because if you put the cell drain here, you will cause more shift. So you go for, for the kill, for the tumor. Look at this. Midline is far on the other side. But again, this is very hazy, ugly tumor. And of course, the hydrocarbons. Of course, we intubated him and sent him for the MRI. He was not known to have any complaints. Suddenly, he just collapsed at home because of his hydrocephalus and the brain uh, tumor inside. So intubated, ventilated, sent to the MRI, and we got these pictures. Look at this. Look at this. Ten capsules done. The whole the whole brain stem, the brain and the bones shifted. Okay, so what's the differential diagnosis? Of course, we did not come across that boy at 11, at one o'clock in the morning and say, oh, what's the differential diagnosis? Whatever his differential diagnosis, they need surgery. But for you now, sitting here at ease, what is the differential diagnosis of this case? Again, people think this is exaggeration. This is the minimum acceptable for anybody practicing anything in relation to the neurology and neurosurgery. You have to have a list of differential diagnoses. I put them as cysts or encephalic cysts, arachnoid cysts, choroid fissure cysts. People don't know about choroid fissure cysts. They don't exist. Pindemal cysts from the pindemal. A neuroglial cyst, and this is all these patients are patients of mine except this one, the Zellweger. I know Zellweger, the uh, the female uh, actress. Exactly. I, I, I love the, the, the lady. She's a, she's beautiful and she's a very well acting. But the Zellweger, I should remember it, is kind of uh, uh, leukodystrophy. Choroid plexus cyst. With dermoid cysts, colloid cysts. This is one of the largest colloid cysts in the world, and this is one of my patients. And he came with what? With shunt. 
disease of the Arab world, disease of the underdeveloped world. I think everybody should be ashamed of himself to put a shot unless it is very mandatory. And don't give us excuses that you are alone at night, nobody is there. There are so many million of solutions to do. But because this is something that you do and take money for, please stop doing it. A good shunt is no shunt. Epidemia, I get one patient of mine. Subependemoma, subependemoma germs, astrocytoma, which we mentioned. They see that. Corroid plexus papilloma, I, I actually presented this case here in this room. Whether <coughs> it is papilloma or atypical or even cancers. So not all the corroid plexus are benign, some of them are malignant. Look at this pilocytic astrocytoma, huge. Again, one patient of mine, we could excise it completely because it is pilocytic. There's no radiation, no chemotherapy for that. We'll wait. Okay, so pilocytic astrocytoma, astrocytoma grade 2, grade 2 or uh, highly malignant. Oligodendroglioma, they love this area. Uh, what is this? This is cordoid glioma. This is ganglioglioma, and this is uh, ganglioneuroblastoma. As if these pathologies don't exist, so we don't think about them. Brain, we think of a glioma, astrocytoma. Um, three kind of pathologies. Pituitary, pituitary adenoma. There are no pathologies there. Abdominal pain, appendix or ovarian cyst. No. So many pathologies, but you don't want to know about them. Neurocytoma, one patient of mine from Sudan. Germinoma, I presented this case to you the other day. Peanut, we'll present it next time. Metastasis, metastasis inside the ventricle, yes. Teratoma, and this is lymphoma. Again, I presented this some time ago. I will revisit uh, that again. We forget about lymphomas. This is a thalamic hemorrhage, and look at this. Who would think that this is an aneurysm? Hydatid cyst, neurocysticercosis, lipoma, tuberculoma. <laughs> they are there, but you don't want to think about them because that will demand that you go and study and read. And people give their certificate to kill and they don't even read a word about it. Once they pass the exam, they don't read. They are masters of the art. And they are just there to kill people. Yes. Of course. So um, the reason why we say uh, it's absurd to have treated a presumed lesion with uh, radiosurgery uh, or embolization followed by radiosurgery is that you're burying the evidence. And when the patient dies, he or he died with brain tumor, which would have been expected. And, and, and the patient dies with the, with the evidence buried with him. <coughs> so these are actual cases. And look at the difference in, 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 in the approach uh, had you known what was going on. And the only way to have known what was going on would have been to do surgery or the test before surgery to avoid surgery if not necessary. Now, the cysts I'm not going to dwell upon because the treatment is surgical and they're predominantly uh, seen in this age group. However, hmm. Epidemoma is treated radically differently after surgery. In pediatrics, we try to avoid radiotherapy as much as possible in pediatrics protocols. In adults, uh, these patients would have gotten radiotherapy after surgery. Um, uh, <laughs> Subepidemoma as well, and then a platinum-based uh, chemotherapy, which is integral in the treatment. Um, 
uh, glioma was generally uh, with all grades, including a uh, grade four. Uh, those would be treated with optimal surgery and alkylator based chemotherapy and radiotherapy, depending upon the age group of the patient you're dealing with. Germinoma, which is even with the presentation with brain metastasis, is treated with curative intent, even if it's metastatic from the germ cell, uh, from the testis or the ovaries. Um, but even if they present with metastasis, the treatment with curative intent, and if they present in the CNS as a primary CNS germ cell tumor that's also treated with curative intent, and the treatment after surgery would be uh, 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 chemotherapy, uh, cisplatin based with radiotherapy, depending upon the age group that you're talking about. Um, lymphoma in this age group would necessitate ruling out uh, systemic leukemia or lymphoma with the second CNS involvement, and the patients in that case would still be treated with curative intent. Um, metastases are probably less of an issue in this age group but it is frequently missed, as are in germicular teratomas. Now, these are actual cases and the treatment would have been radically different. Now, the, the myriad of infections, including TB, and we've forgotten that we are living in, 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 in a part of the world that is endemic for TB. And you miss TB with CNS involvement, the patient simply dies. And all of these would have been masqueraded or, or the, the evidence would have been completely obliterated by radio surgery, um, be that following embolization or prior to embolization. And these are actual cases. This is not a mental exercise of what, what this could have been. We continue hammering this point on a daily, on a weekly basis, and these mistakes continue to happen on a daily basis. So it's the middle of the night. It's maybe two o'clock in the morning. And this is when I opened the dura after hyperventilation, after manitour and steroids and head up and do you know it. Still the brain is bulging out. And the only thing to do is to go for it. Some people would stop and blame the anesthetist. Oh, I have brain edema. This is the anesthetist's fault. It is your fault. It is not the anesthetist's fault. You have to do something about it. And something to do, there is assist, and I want to go for it quickly so that. I will get some of the fluid out. This way, the only way to save this patient's life. So I allow this fluid, dark yellowish fluid to come out, and then I come across the tumor. Again, here is the glow. This is below, this is above, this is anterior, this is posterior. So we are in the superior temporal area at the junction with the right lobe at the marginal and supramarginal angular gyri. So the tumor here looks okay. I was happy. Oh, there is a good plan of cleavage. It looked ugly to me. This is not good. And how would you get a frozen section at three o'clock in the morning in a private hospital? No way. Because by the time the stomatologist would come, the technician would come, God knows. That if anybody answers the phone, start to be in public and in a best hospital, no answer. Of course. But we did throw the section. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm no, not saying that. This is it. Down. I'm saying um, the, the, um, the banality that prevails. So, as, as, as if there is a good plan of cleavage, but then here you see this white matter here, the line of the tumor. I was starting to get disheartened, feeling that this is nasty, but I continued. I will do my best to take as much as I can. The idea of uh, biopsy and, uh, oh, here we are. We decompress the brain, the fluid is out, and we have taken a small piece, let's send them for radiation. This is a crime. When are we going to stop these crimes in the Arab world? A crime that happens every day, maybe 10 times a day, in a country like Jordan or in Syria or Darabur or the Middle East or in Asian countries. This is against the teaching. And I think the surgeon who sent a patient for radiotherapy after biopsy is as a criminal as the radiotherapist, which in this case. Don't accept. And just 
move forward with this. Here at this point, this is the pendulum of the ventricle. I start to feel when we are losing the battle and not being able to take the rest of the tumor out. Let's do as much as we can and see what the strategy is. So this is the trigon, this is the temporal, here it is. I can't remember, but it took about seven hours. This is important. This is feeding artery coming from the posterior choroidal artery. It's a very important step. And I will show you what is the value of this later on. So the brain is slack. We'll see what happens. I will not stop at the strategy here. I will proceed and then discuss it later. Of course, we put an external drain for nurses, for male and female nurses. External drain is not a drain. It is a neurosurgical hell of a job to do. Don't treat the, the external drain as a drain. It is something special. If you put it down, patient or CSF will come down and he will die. So this is the initial post-operative uh, MRI the following day, the following morning. There's a good CSF collection here, but still tumor is there. So this was the initial, and this is how we were left. And then started the battle of what to do. I will uh, discuss later. Uh, so let's go here for the histology. Uh, we waited after the surgery for about three months because there were so many speculations and discussions. In Jordan, we have a specimen of Dr. Hassan al from Jordan Hospital. He reported it as a papillary meningioma. Dr. Salah Jitawi reported it as either a subastoma or a pendemoma or a papillary meningioma. Dr. Mahar Zahir, and uh, Rahat Shaka and Dr. Haddad from King Hussein Cancer Center, and I invited the three of them. I don't know if any of them is here. They reported mammalian meningioma grade three. Dr. Abedat, Fatma Abedat, and Ismail Mutab from King Abdullah reported it as ependemoma astroblastoma. What would you do with this? Okay, so let's let's see what our historians say. Dr. Hassan. Uh, actually, this case was uh, done in 2005, if I remember. Sure. So, a long time ago. And again, unfortunately, we don't have the slides in the block. By Jordanian law, we are obliged to keep the slides in the block for 10 years. But the reports will be kept indefinitely because they can be filed electronically and they don't take much space. So unfortunately, we don't have the histology or the pictures. But luckily, I, I write usually good microscopic descriptions. And this is good because, as you can see, uh, it, is a, it was a highly cellular tumor. And it, was, it has diverse morphology. And they appear to be arising from the meninges overlying the brain. There were areas of brain invasion and seedlings along the meninges. Uh, the tumor cells were slightly variable in size. They were condensed around the, the blood vessels forming pseudopapillae, and there were occasional mitotic figures. The, the background was very vascular with scanted hemangiopericytoma like blood vessels, and there were degenerative changes with excessive hemsiderin. Actually, probably this is what caused the, this dark color on surgery. And there was prominent lymphoplasmistic infiltrate also. So the differential diagnosis by histology was a typical meningioma, ependymoblastoma, vascular tumor, even I thought about the oxac tumor. And I did some immune markers. 
The tumor cells were strongly positive for epithelial membrane antigen and it showed a membrane pattern of staining, which is typical of many tumors. They were negative for GFAP, uh, which uh, excludes ependymoma, actually, because ependymomas are very strong. Uh, ependymomas might be positive for uh, epithelial membrane antigen, but they have a very characteristic dot-like positivity, not unlike here where we have a prominent membrane staining pattern. CD34 was negative also, as well as alpha beta protein, because I thought at that time about yolk sac where they were all negative. So this provides for me favored meningioma. Uh, other diagnoses are unlikely. So I call it a typical meningioma or papillary meningioma. And here, I think I made a mistake. I think I was at that time following the WHO order classification, because in 2000, uh, it, they it, um, uh, put the typical papillary meningioma into the malignant category, which is grade three. And King Hussein Cancer Center, they were right about that. Now, uh, this is not from the same case, but I just to show you, it has a papillary configuration. You can go to the other view. You can see this is very cellular. And uh, the cells are centered around the blood vessels. Actually, it is, these are not true papillae. They are what we call perivascular pseudopapillae. Probably they take this configuration because the tumor is proliferating rapidly and it exceeds its blood supply. So only the cells around the blood vessel will survive and produce this pattern. And this is also a very prominent pseudopapillae. And you can see that this could be also confused with uh, uh, for example, choroid plexus tumor, because it is papillary as well. Okay. Uh, Dr. Uh, Salah Jitawa, are you around? Uh, 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 unfortunately, Dr. Mahal is better than mine. So. Yeah, he, uh, he found me too. Dr. Jitawi from Jitawi lab, he put testoblastoma, papillary pendemoma, papillary pendemoma. This is from King Hussein. Cancer Center, Dr. Rafa Chakra, Dr. Haddad, Dr. Zayer, they called it papillary meningioma grade three. Uh, from King Abdullah, Dr. Fatma Abidat, and Dr. Ismail Matarqa, they reported this after consultation with Edinburgh in UK, uh, Dr. Colin Smith and Dr. Uh, Joseph and uh, James Ironstein, they said this is peanut. So, why not ask people outside? So James Allen Sand and Colin Smith from Edinburgh called it peanut. Werner Paulus from Minister of Germany called it Ninjoma Grade 3. Tarek Tihan from University College of San Francisco. He consulted with two friends, Peter Berger and Bernard Schneider. They called it Ninjoma or Choroid Plexus Tumor. And the family members took it to Canada and Australia and came back as meningioma. If you were in my place, what would you do? So we basically covered all our differential diagnosis. All the differential diagnosis. <laughs> so I was left with this. Let's see what they have wrote. This is Tihan saying, this is a malignant tumor. This is missing camel. Maybe it is meningioma. Oh, maybe it's a coronal plexus tumor. Werner Polis also said here that we send these slides to Tarek Tihan in San Francisco. He raised the possibility of choroid plexus tumor. Again, here he's speaking about it is not very typical of meningioma. Uh, Peter Berger said, I think it would be the great value to complete the surgery. So, this is one man who said, Dr. Sveh, please proceed with enter surgery because it looks like a meningioma. And I took this into heart and I operated again. This is a child, three years old. Don't give him radiotherapy because you are not sure. So here you are. This is the cavity of the ventricular triangle and this is the tumor. Now, putting in mind that this could be an angioma, I wanted to remove it completely no matter what time it takes. This boy future is in my hands. So when you stopped the first time around the Professor Speck, what were you thinking? Malignant, extremely malignant. Yeah, I know that you were extremely ignorant.